Welcome to Reason and Theology, a show dedicated to apologetics, discussions, interviews, debates, and more. The hosts are Catholic, but also welcome charitable conversations with Orthodox, Protestants, and non-Christians. And welcome to the Reason and Theology show. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-hosts William Albrecht, Eric Ibarra, Father Patrick, and our esteemed guest, Metropolitan Callistus Ware. Uh, your eminence, how are you this morning? It's great to have you. I'm doing all right, thank you. Pleased to be talking to you. I don't think it's morning where you, you and Father Patrick are at. I think y'all are in the afternoon at this point, but it's early for uh, William, Eric, and I. We're, we're at six in the morning here, so <laughs> we're delighted to have you. Let me go ahead and formally introduce you. His Eminence Metropolitan Callistus Ware is the titular Bishop of Diocle, uh, Diocleia and Professor Emeritus in Eastern Orthodox Studies at Orthodox Us Oxford University. Metropolitan Callistus is widely regarded as perhaps the world's leading theologian of the Eastern Orthodox and also notable as the author of The Orthodox Church and The Orthodox Way, both available on Amazon.com. And of course, if you have not read The Orthodox Church already, go ahead, go to Amazon, get a copy. You have to read it. It's very, very highly recommended. Uh, but once again, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you on. Uh, Eric is going to go ahead and ask a few questions first because he has to leave here a little bit early. So go ahead, Eric. Your Eminence, we uh, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we look forward to this interview. Um, my, my question to break the ice here has to do with the development of aesthetics in the West. You know, we see from the Baroque period, from the Council of Trent going forward, uh, the, the Catholic Church uh, took a very um, austere and rigid and, and legal framework in how to uh, implement liturgy, um, uh, art, things like that. However, as we came into the 20th century, it seems like there was a bit of a revolution or a devolution of beauty in Western liturgy, Western art. And we're curious what your thoughts are on that and how the West might be able to learn from an Eastern framework of mind. First of all, we have to be very careful about simple and bold contrasts between East and West, because there is great variety in the West and great variety also in the East. Now, it is true that within the West, we have what could be called a tradition of legalism, a use of juridical categories when doing theology. That is not a new thing. That goes right back to an author such as Tertullian at the beginning of the third century. And one example, the use by Tertullian and later Latin writers of the word merit. Merit is not a word that Eastern theologians on the whole use, but it figures widely in Western theology. However, we shouldn't oversimplify the situation because within the West, as in the Christian East, there has been a continuing mystical tradition, a tradition emphasizing direct personal contact with God, and uh, we have outstanding examples of that in Britain in the 14th century, the Lady Julian of Norwich, Richard Roller of uh, Hampole, and others. We have St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa in the 17th century. So that there have been plenty of writers in the West who have not been bound by a strictly legal framework and has emphasized the element of mystical theology. And I see a revival of that precisely in the 20th century, particularly beginning in the 1930s with writers like Henri de Lubac and uh, Jean Daniel Lou, but continuing to the present day. And that tradition within the West, mystical and patristic, has been a good bridge 
bringing the West closer to the Orthodox East. Thank you so much. Uh, in your opinion, uh, Your Eminence, what do you think led many Catholic theologians in the early, early 20th century to uh, explicate that cry of return to the sources, ressourcement, and looking at the whole of the patristic data uh, instead of maybe the what was contemporary to them, the standard theological manual. Was there something that you see as a uh, as a cause for the 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 re that cry to the return to the sources? It is difficult to give a simple and single answer, but. One thing I would note is in the 20th century, we have a breakup of the church state situation in most of the traditional Catholic countries. And here I'm thinking of the changes, for example, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire following the First World War. But to a lesser extent, this happened in other countries where the Catholic Church had been established with a privileged position in education. And this was increasingly questioned, could no longer be taken for granted. And because of this, many Catholics in the period between the two world wars were forced back on essentials. If we are not going to be primarily a state church functioning under the control and direction of the civil authorities, as well as our own church authorities, then what is our basis and principle? And that, I think, led them to the idea of ressourcement. There has been in the 20th century an immense decline of formal established religion this has not been entirely negative because it has made people take a more personal approach and go back personally to the sources. And that I think is what was happening between the two world wars and has continued since. The same thing was going on in the Orthodox world. The church state situation, the Christian empire of Russia collapsed in 1917. And this forced the Russians, especially those who come to the emigration, like Father George Flodovsky or Vladimir Lossky, it forced them again to say, if the church is not a state institution, what is it? And where do we find our authority? Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it's interesting you say that that played out in the in the East as well. Um, would you say there was a, a similarity with the neo-patristic movement? Um, you know, um, the sort of a resource mon in the Eastern Orthodox Church as well. Yes. Let us first of all take account of the way in which. East and West influenced one another. For example, I remember Cardinal Jean Daniel Lou recounting how when he was a young student, he used to go and visit a Russian woman theologian, Mira Lotborodin, who lived outside Paris. And he said that it was from her that he acquired his sense of the fathers as living witnesses. And it was from her that he acquired the ressourcement orientation, which influenced him. But I think again, someone like Vladimir Lossky, who left Russia in early childhood and was brought up in the West, he would have said that he was deeply indebted to Western writers. 
after the Second World War, when in the Soviet Union, the theological schools were being reopened, he was invited to go back to Russia and to teach there. And he said, no, I have been too long in the West. My questions, my approach has been influenced by the West and it is in the West that I must bear witness rather than in my native land. So that's uh, examples of influences from either side. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, my final question has to do with uh, the theology of the icon. Uh, historians tell us that in the late uh, eighth century, uh, that the Frankish West was not as uh, immediately receptive uh, for a variety of reasons uh, to the theology that was uh, behind the icon, although there was a lot of misunderstanding. We, we all know that from the general history. But do you think that the West uh, in recent history has taken a, a more favor, uh, a more um, implementing posture towards the theology of the icon? Do you think that there still remains a difference in Western spirituality with iconography and the Eastern Orthodox? There is a difference of approach. Putting it very simply, from the eighth century, the West has primarily emphasized the didactic role of iconography, that it is a theology in pictures, that it is the Bible of those who cannot read, that it teaches us the faith. And this is certainly which, uh, something which uh, Eastern Orthodox would also maintain. But in Orthodoxy, there has been an emphasis on the icon as a theology of presence. Through the icon, the person depicted, the savior, the mother of God, or a particular saint is made present to the one who prays through the icon of the different mysteries, let us say Christmas or the resurrection. The one who prays enters into the meaning of that mystery. In this way, the icon is a door or a bridge. Now, this idea is also found in the West but I do not think it is so much emphasized. We might say for the Orthodox East that the icon serves as a sacrament and the West did not see that quite to the same extent. But like all simple contrasts, we have to qualify it. Thank you so much, Your Eminence. Um, I'm going to pass this off to Michael and I really appreciate your contribution today. Thank you again. Thank you. I've enjoyed talking with you. Your Eminence, let me ask you, um, what would you say, what role does asceticism play in Orthodox life and theology? God gives us grace, but he has also given us free will. And therefore, we have what could be called cooperation between divine initiative and human response. And so our salvation is the result of two factors, the divine grace and the human freedom. They are unequal in value. What God does for us is far more than what we can do for ourselves, but both are essential. God will not save us against our will. And in this way, we are invited to use our freedom, supported by divine grace, to follow the Christian path. In this way, asceticism 
is another word for the use of our free will for God. And I would call in the word synergia, cooperation. It hasn't always had a good meaning in the West, but that is the way we think of salvation. The human cooperating with God, the Holy Trinity. Excellent. And, and let me also ask you, what exactly is the Jesus prayer? Because we hear this a lot in Eastern Orthodoxy, but I think a lot of Western um, individuals may not be familiar with it. So what exactly is it and how can it strengthen our connection to God? The Jesus prayer is a short invocation designed for frequent repetition, which has at its heart and center the holy name of Jesus. The most common form is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. But you can use other forms if you wish. You can say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm. I use the form, have mercy on us, bringing others in as well. Or you can make it shorter. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Often in the West, particularly in the 14th century, there was the practice of simply invoking the name Jesus on its own. And this is recommended by some Orthodox as well. For myself, I find the holy name of Jesus is almost too powerful mm. used on its own and needs to be diluted with other words. Mm. But the Jesus prayer then is any short invocation designed for frequent repetition containing the holy name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus is seen as containing divine grace. It's not a magic talisman, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, it has power. It has a sacramental value, to use the same word as I used about the icons. Mm. Yeah. Now, if you want to read about the Jesus prayer, a good place to start is the 19th century Russian work known sometimes as the way of a pilgrim or the pilgrim's tale. There are a number of editions and this is not a theological treatise, but it is a description, perhaps imaginary, perhaps based on reality of how a pilgrim uses the Jesus prayer as he wanders from place to place. And that certainly has introduced very many people to the Jesus prayer. It is, one might say, a contemplative prayer, mm. a prayer of waiting on God. How am I going to wait on God? How am I going to attain inner silence? If I just sit doing nothing, I will suffer from endless irrelevant thoughts, not necessarily bad thoughts, but futile thoughts. So the Jesus prayer provides us with a focus and therefore helps us through the words to reach out into the silence of God. And, you know, in the West, you, you often see emphasis on the rosary. And of course, in the East, we see emphasis on the Jesus prayer. Do you think that um, Westerners might benefit from perhaps um, doing both, praying the rosary and the Jesus prayer, and maybe even uh, combining the two in some way? Or, or is that not advisable? I'm not sure how they could be combined <laughs> um, in a single act. But I would say for Western Christians, both are good. There is a tradition within the West of the invocation of the holy name of Jesus, as I've already mentioned. We Orthodox do not claim a monopoly 
but the rosary is something different. Mm -hmm. The rosary is addressed mostly to the mother of God. And there is nothing wrong in that, but the Jesus prayer on the whole does not mention the mother of God, though some people use the form Lord Jesus Christ, son of God, that the prayers of your holy mother have mercy on me, but that is not so common. Yeah. So I would say the rosary is something different from the Jesus prayer. Right. And, and one follow-up question for that, um, you know, with the rosary, there's a lot of emphasis on the Holy Theotokos, um, which I, I want to get your thoughts on this, because as you noted in the Jesus prayer, it's primarily invoking our Lord, uh, whereas the rosary is primarily invoking our lady. Do you think that there's too much emphasis on the Holy Theotokos in the rosary, or can you never have too much emphasis on her? I don't think there is too much emphasis because the rosary exists in a wider context and particularly, of course, the Holy Eucharist Mass, which includes devotion to the Mother of God, but which is centered upon Christ, upon his incarnation, his death on the cross and his resurrection. So. It is true that we don't have an exact equivalent of the rosary. We do use a prayer rope, which looks rather like a rosary. It could be made of beads even, but we use it to say the Jesus prayer. At the same time, the, the liturgy, the, script, the texts which we use in our worship are full of devotion to the mother of God in the Orthodox Church. So I do not think we can say that the mother of God is more emphasized in the West than in the East. Absolutely, fair enough. And um, let me also ask one more question then I'm gonna pass it over to my co-host here, uh, William. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts on perhaps the Western Church appropriating or adopting some Eastern liturgical practices into its own liturgy? Now, I know in the West, you know, a priest can't just start doing whatever he wants to do. I'm saying, you know, with the authorization of the hierarchy and the Pope, of course, what do you think about that? Or do you think that the West should just stay the West and the East should just keep its liturgical conditions and they should never uh, meet in, be in between? What do you think? They can certainly enrich one another, but we need to be cautious about direct borrowings. Mm. The West, the liturgy has its own character, its own ethos, and it would not necessarily be the best thing to join together great chunks of Eastern liturgy and insert them into the West. <laughs> but if we know each other's liturgy, and we Orthodox could learn very much from the liturgical piety of the West, yeah. that would enrich our own tradition. But we have to assimilate it in our own way. Mm -hmm. However, one example of mutual enrichment we've just mentioned, and that's the Orthodox use of icons. Mm -hmm. This has become very popular in the West, and there too, uh, so many Western people experience the icon as a door, as a sacrament. So, yes, we can borrow from one another, but let us not just pick and choose. The spiritual life is not a supermarket. <laughs> Fair enough. And one final follow up question there. You mentioned, you know, the, the West benefiting from uh, the East when it comes to icons. What are some other liturgical practices that the West could benefit from? If, if you could give us a few more examples. Yes. Uh, what I value particularly in orthodoxy is its sense of living tradition. Mm. And therefore, 
I hope that the West could draw on the spirituality of the fathers as it is doing. And by fathers, I mean not just writers in the fourth century, but much later, people such as in the 14th century, St. Nicholas Cavasilas. So I think that the West should not simply appropriate chunks of the Orthodox liturgy. The result might be a kind of mishmash, but it would be very good to read some of the Orthodox liturgical writers. And the West might read, uh, and the East might read some of the Western liturgical writers as well. Mm -hmm. I learned a great deal in my student days from the work of the Anglican, Dom Gregory Dix, The Shape mm -hmm. of the Liturgy. Yeah. Well said. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for chatting me, with me. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to William. Your Eminence, what a great blessing it is uh, being with you uh, for me uh, morning, for you uh, afternoon. I wonder, uh, we, we frequently are aware that some of the most beautiful hymns and teachings become, become, become clearer in the early church about Mary from the Eastern side of the church. In terms of Mariology, how far apart are West and East? Or are we closer than perhaps many people may seem to think on many issues in regards to Mary? In regard to Mary, I believe we are not so far apart. Some Orthodox overemphasize the possible differences it depends on your mentality. Some people like to em emphasize differences rather than similarities. Now, I might give an example. In the Catholic Church, you have defined as a dogma the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah. Some people confuse that with the Virgin Birth of Christ, but the two, of course, are quite distinct. It is the teaching held by Roman Catholicism, that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. Now, most Orthodox are not happy about this definition. Some even regard it as a major difference. I do not. It is primarily a difference in our understanding of original sin rather than our understanding of Mary. That behind the Western doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, there lies the Augustinian notion of original guilt. Not that every Catholic today holds that, but still, that I think is the context. Uh, in the definition of 1854, it says that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. And the word stain is significant idea of defilement, which we would not emphasize. But we Orthodox, as with you Catholics, believe that the Blessed Virgin Mary was free from actual sin. Yeah. And there is what really matters. We in Orthodoxy refer to her as all holy Panakia. Panamomitos without blemish, spotless panacrantos. So we do see the Holy Virgin as an example of holiness. And therefore, to me, the question of the Immaculate Conception is secondary. And there have been Orthodox who've held something very similar to the Western doctrine, and I wouldn't call them heretics. To me, the basic uh, point at issue between the Orthodox East and the Roman Catholic West is the papal claims. Yep. And we Orthodox accept that the Pope should have first place in a universal reconciled Christendom, but we are not happy about the definitions in 1870 concerning his supreme jurisdiction and infallibility. 
this is something that we need to talk about with each other. I don't see a simple solution, but I'm always full of hope. What an incredible, incredibly charitable and, and, and filled with truth reply there. I greatly appreciate it. I agree with you, Your Eminence, that when it comes to the teaching on our, our, our holy Theotokos, that we are very close to each other rather than people that perhaps tend to emphasize how different we are. I've particularly been very inspired with, by what I have read in your writings about uh, the Blessed Mother and how you've even written how you don't have a contention with authors within Orthodoxy or in Catholicism that have spoken on the Immaculate Conception, because that is something near and dear to my heart. I greatly appreciate your reply. Now, to kind of shift it a little bit different, but stuff you've written on as well, um, when it comes to justification or, or salvation understood within Orthodoxy, I, I've, re I've read a, a book that you've written, and you have frequently said that in Orthodoxy, Orthodoxy, salvation is Christ, the Savior. And, and I've read that you've written, we are saved through the total work of Christ, not only by one particular event. To me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this lines up perfectly with what Catholicism can say. To me, it sounds very Augustinian on that particular issue. And perhaps, in my opinion, even perfectly aligns with what Trent says about justification. Can you maybe elaborate on this? Are we on the same page on this particular issue? Justification is not a word that I use very frequently. When I, my first book was published, my Penguin book on the Orthodox Church, a friend pointed out that the word justification did not appear in the index. I hadn't noticed that, <laughs> but it's true that it is much more the 16th and 17th century Protestants who emphasized the word justification. Though we do not reject it, we do indeed believe that through Christ we are justified. However, we would emphasize the total Christ, and you spoke of that, that we would not concentrate only on the cross as saving us. Some people make a simple contrast. The West emphasizes the crucifixion, the East, the resurrection. I don't think that is fair entirely to the West, but it's for the Western Christians to answer that. But certainly, so far as we Orthodox are concerned, we emphasize the cross along with the incarnation, the transfiguration, and the resurrection. It is the total Christ, the whole of his life on earth and his ascent into heaven that we are concerned to live out day by day as Christians. That, that is an incredible, incredible reply. I do have uh, one more, maybe. Uh, I have one more, and then uh, pass it on over to, uh, to Father Patrick. Do you think, maybe in your lifetime, or, or really perhaps in the, in the next 50 years, is reunion possible at all? First, we pray for reunion, and we should give it an important place in our prayer. And we bear in mind that at the supper before his death, Christ was concerned to emphasize, may they all be one. We have that in the prayer, John chapter 17. So unity is the will and desire of Christ. And for that reason, it should be our desire as well. Amen. I do not think at this present moment that the different dialogues between the Orthodox and the Catholics, the Orthodox and the Anglicans, 
the Orthodox and the different Protestant groups are going to bring final dis decisions. I don't see an easy way to a restoration of full Eucharistic communion, and that is our aim. On the other hand, I'm fully in favor of continuing these dialogues. We need to get to know one another. We need to stop making false statements about what our fellow Christians believe. And I, there is an important place for ecumenical friendships. I can say from my own personal experience that certain Anglican friends that I had, Episcopalians, you say, I think, in the States, um, this has been very important to me. So let us love one another. There can be no reunion without love. And if we are to love one another, we must get to know one another. Amen to that. And with that, I will uh, let you know that I feel very blessed by being able to dialogue with you early in the morning. Uh, what, a, what a great beginning to the morning. And thank you very much for an incredible and incredibly charitable dialogue. I do want to pass it to, uh, to Father Patrick. Hello, Your Eminence. Um, I've got three questions I'd like to ask. Um, first one, I think is a lot of listeners would be interested to know, what is the philokalia and how can it help Western spirituality? The title philokalia means love of beauty, love of spiritual beauty, love of divine beauty, love of God as source of all things beautiful. It is used sometimes with reference to, uh, in early Christian texts, to mean an anthology, a collection of beautiful things. But today in the Orthodox world and in the West, when people mention the Philokalia, they are usually referring to a book published in 1782, edited by two Greek monks, the Philokalia of the Holy Neptic Fathers, the fathers who taught Nepsis, which is the Greek word for vigilance or watchfulness. And this is a collection of texts dating from the third or fourth century up to the 15th century. At first, the Philokalia was not greatly noticed in the Greek world, but gradually, particularly since the Second World War, it has come to influence more and more people in the West as well as in the traditional Orthodox countries. It is a difficult work. Many people opening it are disappointed because it doesn't immediately speak to their condition. But I would encourage all of you to dip into the Philokalia and see what you find there. Thank you, Your Eminence. Now, the next question is, there's a rather abstract style to the classical icon um, in the East. Now, one can see a distinct difference between this and late medieval Renaissance rendering of common um, icon images like the crucifixion of Christ, the, um, the mother of God holding the infant Christ and various biblical scenes. And I'm wondering how you think that this reflects a possible distinction in the sense of religious beauty and in the place of the image in Christian life and worship. As regards Western religious art, we have to say, first of all, that it has had a very deep influence on the Christian East. The Russians, and the Greeks from the 17th century onwards began painting icons in a Western style influenced by people such as Raphael and Murillo. 
and in the Orthodox Church, there has been only in the last 50 or 80 years a reaction against this and a desire to return to the true Byzantine tradition of religious art. Now, we have to avoid simple contrasts, as I've said already. But one thing I find in the art of the West, particularly from the Baroque era, is that it is strongly emotional. In Orthodox icons of the traditional kind, there is also deep feeling, but it does not appeal only to the emotions. And therefore, I find sometimes in Western religious art of the Renaissance, well, not so much the Renaissance, not so much people like Botticelli, whom I love very much, but later painters, I find a lack of the sobriety that I value in Orthodox art. But we can go on learning from one another and enriching our spiritual life by learning about each other's traditions. Thank you, Your Eminence. And my last question is, what are your thoughts on the relation of a more regional or local implementation of liturgical practices in the, in the East? So there's the uh, practices, say, of a church of Antioch, the churches in Greece, the churches in Russia, are much more locally controlled, as opposed to a very centralized Roman Catholic way of, especially since Trent, not prior, but especially since Trent, and in recent, the New Order, uh, which has become very centralized uh, implementation. What, what are your thoughts on the, 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 the distinctions between that or uh, the effects of that or how that works? Yes, how are we to reconcile freedom and unity? Now, I was brought up as an Anglican, an Episcopalian, and I remain permanently grateful for my Anglican upbringing. But one of the things that troubled me in Anglicanism was the extreme variety, the many different ways in which the Holy Mysteries, the Eucharist in particular, were celebrated. Going from one church to another, you would find a different kind of service. What I've experienced as a sense of release in orthodoxy was that there is a unity of worship. Of course, there are differences of detail in different local churches. And the way the liturgy is celebrated in, for example, the Russian church and the Greek church is not the same. There is a different atmosphere, but still there is a very strong unity and I would not want to see us Orthodox lose this. But there is room for variety. For example, in the commemoration of saints, I'm fully in favor that we should in the divine liturgy commemorate our local saints, get to know the Christian roots of the land in which we live. And so we should incorporate the commemoration of these saints into our liturgical worship. But I would say, let us Orthodox hold fast to the liturgical unity that we possess, which is to be very precious. I do not have to ask of a particular Orthodox parish, what do they do? I know what they will do, though each parish will do it slightly in a different way. And how do you think um, sort of the centralized approach? So you have the contrast with the Anglican, which is very individualistic. The Orthodox, which seem to have kept a very strong unity despite the sort of regional um, variations in it. And yet, what do you think about the Roman Catholic centralized approach where you where it's sort of dictated from the one spot for, for all? I regret that there is often 
confusion and conflict in the Orthodox Church. And certainly we say the church is heaven on earth, but it is many other things as well. So I won't idealize the situation within orthodoxy, but I value unity rather than centralization. I would see the Pope, for example, in a reconciled Christendom as being the elder brother, but not as being the supreme ruler. And so there should be interchange. One of the essential elements of the church is communion, what Russian theologians call subornost, the spirit of unity in freedom. I don't want to see a single source of juridical power in the church. The essential element of the church is the celebration of the Eucharist in each local parish, in each local Eucharistic center. So don't let's be too centralized. Don't let's want things to be too tidy. Thank you, Your Eminence. Bye, thank you. <laughs> Um, Your Eminence, I, I know you wrote a, um, a, a lengthy introduction to uh, The Ladder of Divine Ascent by John Climacus. Now, I think a lot of our Western uh, viewers and listeners are probably not very familiar with this work. So could you briefly tell us about this and, and how it could help the West in its spirituality? St. John Climacus, St. John of the Ladder, that is what Climacus means, was abbot in Mount Sinai in the seventh century. And his work on the spiritual life, entitled The Ladder of Divine Ascent, has remained a classic work within orthodoxy up to the present day. But we mustn't be too optimistic. It is a work written by a monk, primarily for monks. So if Western people who know nothing about the Christian East and perhaps have very little contact with monastic life take this book up, they may be sometimes a little worried and deterred. Nonetheless, it is an important book for us Orthodox. All Orthodox laity as well as monks are supposed to read the Ladder of Divine Ascent every year in Lent. I don't know how many of them do, but that's what we are encouraged to undertake. And there is an edition printed in the series by the Paulist Press, The Classics of Western Spirituality, which perhaps is a good place to start if you want to read this work. However, all serious spiritual writings demand genuine effort, ascetic effort, if you like. So do not expect too much unless you are willing to put your own input into it as well. Mm. Excellent. Um, now, there are just a few chat questions if, it's, if you have just a few moments. Um, Benjamin asks, uh, which books on Orthodox spirituality would you recommend over others? I have been greatly helped by the writings of Father Lev Gillet, who was a French Orthodox, who wrote under the pseudonym of a monk of the Eastern Church. And I have derived much help from his book, Orthodox Spirituality, and from his writings about the Jesus Prayer. It was through reading his works that I came to know more about the Jesus Prayer. So that would certainly be a place to start. Another author I would recommend would be the Romanian writer, 
Father Dimitri Stanilare, and he, we have numerous writings of his available in English, and I would recommend those. Another text that deeply influenced me is the Sayings of the Desert Fathers, the Apophthegmata. I got to know that many years ago, long before I was Orthodox, through the collection by Helen Waddell called The Desert Fathers. But while she only gives selections, there is a complete translation made by Anglican nun, Sister Benedicta Ward. And I would recommend very deeply this collection of sayings and anecdotes from the early monastic fathers of the fourth and fifth century. That's perhaps enough to be getting along with. Uh, Parker says uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has monasticism as a vital role in their church. In the West, it seems to be dying out. How can the West regain their monastic ways? If I had a quick and simple answer to that, you could appoint me Pope very promptly. In the history of monasticism, there have been periods of decline and periods of renewal. I believe in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there is a decline at the moment in Western monasticism, but I believe the Holy Spirit is still with us and that he has surprises in store. In the Orthodox Church, there have been also periods of decline in monasticism. For example, when I first went to the main center of Orthodox monasticism, the Holy Mountain of Athos, in the year 1961, I found hardly any monks under the age of 50. It was a rare thing to see a black beard in any of the monasteries. Now, there has been a revival young people began to come again from the late 1960s onwards. And wherever you go, in some monasteries, it's quite difficult to see a white or gray beard. And this did not come through the work of some committee. It somehow arose out of the grassroots. People began coming to the monasteries, rediscovering monasticism. I believe that the same thing could happen in the West. Now, um, Teresa asked, what will it take to reunite uh, East with West? You touched on what it a little bit more, but if you can explain. Reunite East and West. Mm. It will take the grace of God. Mm. At the beginning of the divine liturgy, the deacon says to the priest, it is time for the Lord to act. And we can take that as the motto for our work of unity. Christian unity will not be a manufactured article, an artificial man-made product. It will be the work of God. Christian unity will be a miracle from God. What we can do is to remove some of the human obstacles to the free working of the Holy Spirit and to wait, open our hearts to the miracle so that Christ and the Holy Spirit may act within us. So let us always see Christian unity primarily as a gift from God rather than as a result of our own efforts. At the same time, I am fully in favor of the dialogues which are going on as long as they do not involve compromise. I do not expect before the second coming for there to be complete unity, but I pray for unity. Excellent. And um, now this one is from Joshua. He says, uh, what would you recommend we do to foster reunion and also Catholics who are concerned about Vatican II, 
uh, in Pope Francis, would you suggest that they convert to orthodoxy or stay where they're at? God has different vocations for all of us. I was brought up, as I've already mentioned, in the Church of England, and I have always grateful memories of what I received. But I felt at a certain point it was God's call for me to become visibly a member of the Orthodox Communion. I would not say I found a different light in Orthodoxy. I found the same light as I had already experienced as an Anglican, but I found it in a purer, more intense form. The same light, but greater. Mm. However, I respect those who have found it to be their vocation to stay in the church to which they already belong. Presbyterians like Professor Thomas Torrance, who loved the Orthodox and admired the fathers like Athanasius, but he, his vocation was to remain in his own church. And I would see again, as an example, someone I knew personally, Archbishop Michael Ramsey, Archbishop of Canterbury. And he said to me, he regarded the Orthodox Church as the true church. In a sense, he said that Orthodoxy has a fullness of theology and spiritual life not to be found anywhere in the West. But he said, God has put me in the Anglican Church and I must work from there for unity. So God has different calls to different people. I would never put people under pressure to become Orthodox. They must do so freely on their own conscience. But I would say the door is open. Let them become Orthodox, however, not for negative reasons, not for a feeling of anger or disappointment with their own church, but because of something positive which they've discovered in the Christian East. And one last question, um, Elijah Yassi asks, he's, he's one of our contributors, by the way, he asks, uh, based on your discussion with William about the Virgin Mary, um, if the East believed that we are conceived under the dominion of the devil the way that the West does, um, can you see them holding to the Immaculate Conception where Mary is conceived under friendship with God? There you are raising the question, what do we mean by the fall? What do we mean by living in a fallen world? Now, the fall certainly has physical consequences. I think we could all agree on that. Sickness, old age, bodily death. How far does the fall have moral consequences? How far does it mean that we have lost our freedom of choice? I would say, no, God has not taken away our freedom. The purpose of divine grace is to enhance our freedom. Therefore, I do not think that human nature is irrevocably corrupt. Yes, we suffer a disintegration because of the fall. We live in a world which is easy to do evil, much harder to do good. With people I know, I could say to them in 20 minutes things so cruel that they would never forget them. But could I in 20 minutes tell them things so beautiful that their life would be change forever. So we live in a world where there is a certain bias, but certainly on the orthodox understanding, Augustine and still more Calvin went too far in stressing the corruption of human nature. We are still made in the image and likeness of God. We can find God in our hearts if we search. The purpose of his divine grace given us through membership in the church, through the sacraments, that is 
that we should be free and become truly human, but we have not lost our humanity. There is still beauty in this world, though there is also ugliness, but the beauty is more important. Look at the light, don't look at the darkness. <laughs> Well said, Your Eminence. Thank you so much. This has been an excellent uh, hour that you've given to us. I really appreciate you coming on. I want to direct everybody again to your book, The Orthodox Church on Amazon.com and also The Orthodox Way. It's a good uh, companion to it after you read uh, The Orthodox Church. Now, is there anything else that we could look for uh, fr from you? Are there any books coming out? At the moment, I'm working on volume five of the Philokalia, mm -hmm. which will complete our English translation of the Philokalia, which we began in the 1970s. That is very nearly ready. But I am also collecting together my articles, which I scattered in many periodicals. Some of them were collected some years ago in a book called The Inner Kingdom, and I've now got a second volume more or less ready, and I plan a third volume with the things I've written about the Jesus Prayer. But I'm also working on a dispute that took place in the 12th century at Constantinople about the nature of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Mm. The Eucharist is a sacrifice, but what does that mean? It is not obvious. And there were some very interesting things said on the Greek side during that period. And I've written two thirds of a book about that. I think this particular theme has been neglected. I'd like yeah. to finish that if God gives me strength and time. I, I sure hope so. I pray for that because uh, that that's exciting. I really look forward to that. So hopefully we'll be able to read that soon and the others as well. Uh, but once again, I want to thank you for coming on your eminence. You're welcome on the show anytime. Thank you. Amen. May God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, and share this on your social media. Also, don't forget, go to patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. Till next time. God bless you all. So.